Okay, so welcome back to Creatives Grab Coffee. Today we have Sasha from August Media. August Media is a boutique digital marketing agency that covers everything from content production, content managing, and design. Sasha, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me again. It's crazy. It's been now, what, two years? Almost two years, years since we had you on. Oh my God, so that's two years into the pandemic, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, like we basically interviewed you when it was like somewhat at the, not necessarily the start, but early stages. And now we're bringing you back for ending stages almost. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fingers crossed, right, guys? <laughs> but how's it been? How's it been over the last uh, few years or the last two years? Uh, it's been a right. Uh, it's been a right. We've, I feel like we've adapted quite nicely, uh, learned a lot, uh, definitely got stronger <laughs> through this. Um, I would say together with our clients. So, you know, the sword pandemic doesn't sound as scary anymore. Uh, you know, there's a lot more certainty around it as comparing to two years ago. So, you know, um, things are things are relatively good. It's it's nice to see, you know, both our clients, our artists, uh, our peers all coming out of it and, and, you know, going back to the field, shooting real stuff with real people in person. Um, yeah, no, 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 no complaints. <laughs> I remember Amazing. when you first came on, you, you were telling us how, because you have three businesses you run, right? And August Media is one of them. You were telling us that August was actually doing very well compared to the other mm -hmm. ones and how you were going to work more on it to grow it and make it a, an even bigger part of your uh, three businesses. Yeah, well, he was expanding. He was expanding at the time, at a time when everyone was kind of downsizing or just kind of pausing in their in their workflows. Sasha, you were talking to us about how you were hiring new people. You're working even more than ever. It was it was very kind of shocking for us at first. We were like, "Wow, this is great, amazing." And that's that's exactly what was happening. And then we kind of hit a different roadblock that we didn't expect. Where we started growing a little too fast. Um, so we didn't spend enough time on, you know, really optimizing the processes or coming with the right processes. We're basically, you know, just trying to onboard as many clients as we could at that point, trying to hire and onboard as many employees or social media managers as, um, you know, to support those new clients. And then kind of hit the new roadblock where, you know, we grew a little too fast and we realized that the process we came up with were not necessarily the best ones or the most efficient ones. And then, you know, at some point we're dealing with a problem where the revenue was going up at, you know, at pretty nice uh, pace, but um, couldn't say the same about the profit. So we really had to hit the brakes and really stop with everything that we were doing and say, you know, listen, <laughs> something, something is not coming together. Like something like we're busier than we've ever been, you know, and only getting busier, but it's not showing on the bottom line. Uh, so you know, kind of had to go through the whole like, process improvement uh, project, uh, say around October, September, October last year, uh, reset everything, restart everything. And, you know, like uh, after we came back from the holidays, like around January, like I can say, like we're finally working as the world, world machine, ready to continue with the growth. So, you know, really, really excited about this stage as well. So, you know, kind of interesting problems to have <laughs> during the pandemic, um, you know, where you have like one side of business um, that is still really, really struggling. And then the other side of business is struggling for completely different reasons, right? So one side, yeah. we don't get enough clients. On the other side, we get so many clients that we don't really know how to, <laughs> how to deal with it as a small business. But, you know, I can say that, you know, finally everything is back on track on both ends. So with the demand and also with the with the with the capacity with the supply and with our with our processes. One thing that's come up in the other episodes we've had is a uh, talk of systems and how you really need to create really detailed systems hmm. so that you know you you are a well-oiled machine. Uh, I'm just wondering how 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 you took a step back to reflect on the systems that you did have in place and how they were inefficient and how you kind of sat down and just reorganize them and rework them. So how, how was that process? I, th I think the biggest, like? the biggest gap and the biggest problem was that again, like because the leadership team was kind of involved in so many different uh, businesses or activities, um, you know, from like Mintrum to Purple Tree, and then when you have one side of business that is doing really, really well, then naturally you kind of take your eyes off, 
and then you start helping with the parts of business that are you know maybe struggling a little bit more and then you get a little bit of blindsided and then you know we're obviously think that we know what we're doing at all times and we've done this before not the first rodeo and then any kind of thing that you know everything is good because the money is coming in um and then you quickly realize that you know all your old processes potentially you know like we're not we're not working as great um yeah, so as I said, like we kind of saw that um, on the bottom line, you know, the cash flow wasn't the problem, but at the end of the day, like we didn't really see much staying on the account. So very quickly that we realized that we need to do something and it was a complete stop. So basically we agreed that we're not taking on any more clients. Uh, we're not hiring any more employees. Um, doesn't matter if it's a client, if it's the artist or people in the support functions until we figure out what's going on. So I myself come from the process improvement background where I used to work for a, a big, uh, one of the big banks um, doing exactly that, basically process improvement, where I would go and uh, look at the existing processes and the back office operations um, and then figure out the, the best processes for going forward. And I was able to recruit one of my former colleagues because uh, obviously, you know, managing so many businesses and being under so much stress, it's really hard to concentrate on one specific task and spend more than 15 or 20 minutes um, doing the deep dives. Uh, so she came on board, uh, she kind of took a couple of our existing employees under her wing uh, and really like coached and trained and mentored them. And then at the same time, they kind of shared more with her about the existing business. And together, they kind of like formed this little process improvement group, you know, with the external subject matter expert and also, you know, all the internal folks who know, understand the clients, who understand the issues that the current employees are dealing with. Uh, and then basically, yeah, after spending about two, two and a half months, they were able to improve the processes with the current systems that were already had in place, but also like introduce some of the new, you know, tools and project management tools, the time tracking tools, whatnot, and really made it made it work well for everyone. So again, not just for not just for the clients, but also for the employees. Uh, and you know, 90% of it was really eliminating the redundant activities, you know, unnecessary, you know, passing off the tasks or um, on the other hand, like delegating a little bit more. So that was fun. That was fun. Kind of brought me back to my old corporate days even though like I wasn't as involved myself but just kind of like you know watching out all the process maps that the teams put together you know looking at the numbers the savings whatnot uh, and then also like introducing some of this new process to the clients themselves and seeing their excitement and seeing the productivity just going up do you have any when you're looking at oh oh, sorry sorry, Daria I was just gonna ask like for other businesses that maybe are in a in a stage that you were at earlier where they they do have systems that do need to be updated or improved do you have any tips for what they could do um i would say first of all don't stop trying um i know they're you know smaller businesses like ours can not necessarily afford a custom built uh, custom built systems like you know crm systems or project management tools or whatnot so you kind of have to depend on those solutions that are available out there online and you know first of all it's not easy to pick the best solution for for your business um and then a lot of the time doesn't matter what solution you pick as your first one still takes a, quite a bit of time to uh, you know implement it introduce it make sure that everybody knows how to use it and then you know three four months later when you realize that this potentially might not be the best fit or the best the best tool for the team you kind of feel a little demotivated because you already spend so much time and you're not willing to try something different, something new, just because again, like, you know, like your time, your time is extremely valuable to you and you think that, you know, it's just going to be a waste. Uh, but I feel like, you know, you just, doesn't, doesn't matter what experience you had before, like if something is not working for you and you feel like you're going to waste time, you know, in the short, in the short term, it's still it's still worth it just giving it another try and trying something new until you come across something that really works and really helps your team really helps your bottom line really helps your client so yeah basically don't give up if you don't have a big budget that just means that you have to you'll have to spend a bit of an extra time like figuring things out and 
you know, looking for that solution that, that's the best for your organization. And a lot of the time, you know, you talk to your peers and you know, like what's working for one company for one set of clients is not necessarily going to work for everyone else, right? So there's a reason why there are so many, you know, services out there, you know. Well, one thing we have to remember is that it's an ongoing, like developing processes is ongoing. You know, like they're all, we're always trying to improve them. It's never, we figured it out. This will work forever. You know, <laughs> and that's just the one thing that we all have to remember uh, as we're going about it. We can't always think, you know, sometimes, um, oh, this uh, this thing, like, I don't want to uh, work on it later. I want to make sure it's done now so we don't have to worry about it. But sometimes you have to keep improving it. It's like developing your content, developing uh, the product that you're giving to clients. You, you don't just create uh, a t-shirt and then it's ready to go and that's it you know you're constantly trying to think of different ways of how yeah, how it will fit how comfortable will it be what material is it made of you want to keep thinking about how to improve it you know sometimes uh dario and i when we're working on some of our own content for laps and for creative scrub coffee we think to ourselves okay we have our, our video system set we're good to go but no we have to we have to think about ways to improve it see what works better over time and how it can go and especially as you mentioned with certain processes you know for um uh for like onboarding and everything like that you have to make sure that you're constantly improving it you know otherwise it's you're you're doomed to have that same issue that you uh, mentioned that you have you know where the where the revenues were coming in but the profits were roughly staying the same $1000 on $1000 profit on $10000 in revenue is a lot different than a thousand dollar profit on a hundred thousand dollars in revenue, right? I also find that you know, like every single person out there, especially business owners, are dealing with with their biases, right? As, as I mentioned, like once you invest into something, you kind of like almost get to touch, get to touch to it. I, I don't know how many times you walked out of a bad movie when you went to the theater. Probably never. A couple or times. Have you? A couple, mm, couple of times? times. Okay, well, then good for you. But <laughs> so then that means that you learn something. But I know like most of the people, you know, they will pay for the admission ticket. They will go into the theater. They'll sit down. They'll spend 40 minutes. They realize that the movie is shit, but they will still continue sitting until the end because they already paid for it, right? Oh, <laughs> my favorite my favorite memory of this, though, is when Dario and I went to see the movie called Movie 43. And <laughs> people thought it was done halfway through. <laughs> and half the audience left Dario and I we were, we were just a little bit slow in getting up and then all of a sudden the movie <laughs> continued again and we we're like oh there's still more this oh, oh okay <laughs> I can't believe you brought that one up that is <laughs> I never thought that movie get brought up again <laughs> it was just such a standout movie going experience because we went into that because not not knowing what to expect and it just completely you know which movie know. we should have walked out of dumb and dumber too <laughs> that was a horrible movie <laughs> i think oh, yeah, after that, that movie terrible. after that movie that's when we started walking out of movies <laughs> but I, th I think I, th I, th I think that's 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 an amazing experience like when you do it once like you realize that your time is worth so much more than <laughs> you know like the three four dollars that you're gonna you're gonna waste <laughs> an admission by not sitting through it until the very end and i feel like it's kind of like the same with with some of the technology some of the softwares and tools the processes you know just because you invested in something and you spend time kind of like learning it and you know implementing it but if it's not working it's not working you need to, you need to try something else right at what point do you decide where it's not working because sometimes like you just have to wait a little bit longer for it to finally kick in but then there's also a certain point where it's like okay i think it's time to move on how do you decide or how do you figure out what time right. is the time to move on and again, like I think, I think that we sit on something for a little too long. Uh, again, it doesn't matter if it's, we talk about letting someone go, be it a client, uh, you know, a colleague, an employee, a friend, <laughs> uh, for a little too long because for the same for the same reason, right? Because we invested so much, so much time and effort into it. Um, so you really need to have like specific metrics, right? You need to look at the bottom line. You need to look at the metrics. So if you start seeing that the numbers are not there and something is not, not working, like that should trigger some sort of an action, right? Um, so if we're talking again about, um, about the bottom line and you know that you have specific margins, um, you know, you, you, you want to make like 30% 
as a profit and then you see that you're not you're not making that consistently for let's say even like a month or two and that should be a signal that hey like you need to look at something something is not right like you're either discounting your work a little too much which i mean sure <laughs> up to you but if it's strictly about the processes then to me like that's that should be that should be an easier fix so again, like you have to, as a business owner, like you have to look at the numbers, right? Like you can't use just pure emotions or, or anything else. Like the numbers will tell a bigger, a bigger story than, than the picture sometimes. It's a good arbitrary metric to, that just kind of, or sorry, not arbitrary, uh, neutral metric that can kind of to tell you whether things are working and not working. I mean, obviously it depends on the type of processes. I mean, if what if it's though a system in your business that doesn't necessarily come from say revenues or profits or anything like that, you know, if you're developing your own content, I guess more so if you're developing content for promotion, it would be more so the views, the engagement and things like that, right? There's always a number at the end of it, Kirill. Yeah, yeah, there really is always a number, no matter what. There's always a number. There's a met there's a metrics or a dollar sign at the end of it, but there's always a number. Hundred percent. And as creatives, you know, like we're more visual. We're more, you know, like most creatives are perfectionist as well. And sometimes it's really hard to kind of be honest with yourself. Um, you know, I always say that. You know, if we're talking about the processes and not necessarily the bottom line. It's like, you know, when do you know that it's time to stop editing? That you know. Know, like this is this is good enough this is exactly what the client paid you for you know you can do better right you know you can spend like another hour another day another week on making it look even better but how do you know that this is the time to say okay this is good now now it's time to share it with the client instead of you know spending more time on it so that's when you got to turn your biz your business uh brain on and go like okay this needs to be closed because we need to move on to the next one so i guess when you are running like your own business you do have to manage both sides you know there's a left brain right brain type of thing you have to manage your creative side with the business side because if you let the creative side run rampant it'll never be perfect i remember uh hearing a story about how uh when scorsese was at the premiere of goodfellas he was still talking to i think he was talking to the writer nicholas pelagi and he's like oh that shot i should have fixed it like that and he's like he's still thinking about the edits he wants to the movie and nicholas pelagi was like Marty, it's done. Leave it alone. Like it's already on the screen. The movie's done. <laughs> We're here. We're at the theater. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, I, I appreciate that. And I think this conversations need to continue and you always need to be your own kind of crit crit critic, right? But at some point you need to say, okay, like I'm gonna do it on the next project. I'm not gonna do it with the next video. You know, and potentially, hey, like maybe I'm gonna charge you a little bit more as well, because I know it's gonna take me a little bit more time. But I know this is the type of work I can deliver. Or again, if you can perfect it and you can um, you can take that next step and put some extra efforts into it. But then, hey, like, are you going to use it in the portfolio piece? Again, like, are you going to show it to the next client and say, hey, this is what we can do, but this is the price tag that comes with it? Yeah, I guess it really depends on the type. Like you said, it really depends on the type of project. Uh, sometimes we um, we've had guests on the show mention, you know, some of us for the real some is for the meal you know <laughs> and uh it, it, like obviously with some projects say for example if you were creating uh, a simple like print ad or um or kind of like a 30 second highlight video versus say like a full feature mm -hmm. documentary piece or something like that the effort you have to weigh uh, how much time and effort needs to go into it and obviously also with the amount of budget that goes behind it that's as you mentioned before there's that other metric of how much time you need to be spending on certain projects how much money is backing this particular project and i feel like you know these metrics are not only for yourself like these are also the metrics that you will want to share with the client as well right so, you know, like the difference between like a social media video versus a branding video versus campaign video, you know, like you want to communicate that ahead of time and kind of set the expectations, you know, sometimes both for yourself, but obviously for the client, for the client as well. And that, that really helps to like being just like upfront, like setting the expectations. Um, so, you know, like if the client has seen your work as a, you know, highlight really like and all the best, the best pieces that you have produced in the last year and the last five years, you also need to make sure that you're setting the expectations right and you know and they know exactly what they're gonna get you know for the budget that we're working with as as the artists so 
Yeah, we have to educate the clients and let them know. And like you said, setting expectations is so important because sometimes clients might think, oh, uh, if I give you this budget and I want to get that type of product, that's possible, right? But then mm -hmm. you can let them know. It's like, no, it, it goes in. Uh, that budget can get you a little bit of this, but we need you actually need this much to kind of produce this type of product. Or even sometimes they might come to you and say, yeah, you know, this is great. That's a great budget to work with. We could do that. And also this, this, and this, because sometimes you might be able to do more for what they provide as well. So it's all about having those key conversations and managing expectations. But this is where it turns a little bit more into um, art again, and less, less of a science where like, how do you build those relationships with the client where you can be like fully transparent with them and vice versa, where you can say, Hey, you know, like, like, you know, it's, it's always the chicken and egg kind of question, you know, how much is it going to cost? And, you know, but what's your budget? <laughs> right. And then, so, so my favorite, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite clients are those that, you know, we have this trusting relationship with and, you know, they'll come back to me and say like, want this, this and that, but this is their budget. And then we'll reallocate that budget towards the things that will really make a difference for them. Right. So what they're thinking might you know, might not be necessarily the best thing because they're not the creatives, they're not the artists and they're getting the instructions from someone else. Um, so again, it's just going back to like having that, you know, relationship with, with your clients where you can help each other. <laughs> how do you, how do you go about like, because for, for us, since we're doing like, it's usually a video by video uh, project. So like on our website, for example, we already have like our video start at like 5K, right? Mm -hmm. But with you, since you're an agency, how do you go about informing clients like what their project might cost if they're just mm -hmm. or like even trying to get information of their budget? Because it seems like the filtering process for you might be a little trickier because with us, we can already do a lot of the vetting right on our website because before they even get to contact us, they need to select the budget. But with you, it's right. kind of like because you're offering so many more different services, right? Versus us, we're just offering strictly video and usually it's a one off video, right? Right. But that's, you know, so I, I think it might be a little bit easier for us because with all our clients, we have this ongoing relationship. So barely do we do like a one off thing for, for any of that clients. Doesn't matter if it's on the corporate side or if it's an August media client. So usually we offer them different solutions for, for, for different needs that they might have. <clears throat> so I find that it's a little bit easier to build that relationship where you know, you offer all these different services. And a lot of the time, again, like you can, you can, you know, come up with some sort of a package deal and say, hey, like, understand, like the budget might be a little bit tough. Like, let's cut on this thing because we can't sacrifice on the video this month. So, you know, so let's do, so again, like on the August media side, like most of the uh, clients that we put videos together for, you know, we'll also manage their content. We'll also do their photography. We'll also do their social media management. We'll also run their ads. So we say, hey, you know, like we understand, there's only so much that we can spend this month. And if the video is the priority, then let's cut something else. So we definitely have a little bit more flexibility. And then sometimes we'll be like, you know, let us prove it to you that if we do it like this, if we work with this budget, then we can really make a difference for you. So let's pause everything else. Let's see how the video is going to perform. You know, let's put a little bit more money into this and then, you know, basically decide for yourself after whether whether it was worth it or not, whether we should go back to the previous spend on the video and like again spend more on the ads or spend more on on the photography content. But I, I feel like a lot of our clients, and that's another thing that has happened in the last two years with you know Instagram algorithms changing and the whole industry changing so fast where like the photography is not enough anymore. You know, the design is not enough anymore. Like I feel like the videography, the videographers the production companies are getting a lot more love now comparing to two years ago. And but the one good thing about you guys in terms of how you can develop your client relations is the fact that you have that flexibility of all the different services you provide. Uh, when clients come to video production companies, typically it's a very specific need that they need for a certain time. They Not everyone is going to have a need to have a video done every week, every month, every, 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 every little mm -hmm. while. But there is sometimes going to be need for photo content, for design, for website, for the, the whole mix. And because you guys can provide those customized solutions where one month uh, they do, uh, you guys do video, another month you do design, you're still developing that client relationship, but you're doing different services. Whereas in our case, 
uh, we would be uh, there for the video for that month. But then because the client is working on other types of mm -hmm. uh, projects, uh, we don't have that time to develop the relationship further for that specific, uh, those specific types of needs and services. So that is one of the big advantages that an agency like yours has over, say, a typical video production company or a design company or a photography company only, sure. right? For sure. And then, you know, when you start working almost as a continuation of your team and you become, you know, their uh, content production company, the marketing company, a, a consulting company, and then obviously, like eventually you have a much better understanding of, you know, the client's struggles, challenges, but also uh, successes and the type of revenue that they're bringing in. And you just get like a more holistic get a better holistic picture of who they are and what's important for them. And, um, and again, like you're building that trust where they can talk freely about what they can afford versus what they can't afford. And as you said, like a lot of the time they'll, they'll come to us and be like, Hey, like we need to, to refresh the website and the website itself is not, you know, a cheap, cheap, cheap product. Uh, so they'll say, well, maybe, you know, maybe we can go get like the photography done somewhere else. And at this point, like for us, it doesn't matter if, we, if we're making money or not, like if they're going to go somewhere else, we're okay to offer them photography sometimes at cost, for example, just to make sure that they get like the best possible website. You know, like our designers, you know, would pref obviously prefer to work with our own artist as opposed to working with someone else. So again, by offering those services, we definitely get a lot more flexibility and we definitely get to know our clients a lot better. And that was kind of always the goal to, instead of trying to get as many clients as possible, you know, try to have a smaller number of clients, but offer a wider variety of services to them. And one thing we've talked about in other episodes is that a lot of modern production companies are starting to blend the line in a way between being a video production company and sometimes like a, a, a marketing agency because it's like to stand out it's like we're not we're trying to be like consultants we're trying to see what their problem is how we can fit mm -hmm. into that solution we're trying to make them think about all the other uh things they need to think about when they're creating a video right but, but it always seems like okay we're trying to create results driven videos but at the same time we can't be the results driven part without like a marketing agency. So there's been like this funny thing that we've started to notice where mm -hmm. we're trying to, we're, we're implementing elements from like marketing agencies like yours, but within the production space. But even then we're still kind of like hindered by the fact that we don't offer marketing services. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, it's because like with video, it's a more, we're more specialized at that point, right? Um, with agencies, uh, uh, typically with agencies, they do a mix of everything and they bring in the, uh, the specialists to help them achieve that vision. That's why there's all, all, for many, many years, it's been that kind of relationship where agencies hire video production companies. And that's how a lot of people in the industry operate because the video production companies don't have to sell necessarily to mm -hmm. clients. And then <clears throat> the agencies come right in with the, the brief the needs, um, they see which production companies can help them execute that vision, and then everyone gets to work, right? Whereas Dario, you and I are uh, in our video production company, we're also selling to clients specifically. And uh, that's where, as you said, sometimes has the, those challenges, but um, very different compared to the agency model as well. I, I, also, I think it also thing... oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, it also depends on the type of clients that you cater to. Like, are they small to medium-sized businesses? Are they big corporate clients, you know, with their own marketing teams uh, who are, like, used to working with, with the agencies or, you know, different contractors? So I feel like with August Media type of clients, which is like definitely more of a, a small business uh, to medium-sized business, uh, where we deal mainly with the owners themselves, and a lot of the time, like they don't have the capacity, they don't have the time in the day to manage, you know, relationships with multiple vendors, right? Like they would rather have a one-stop shop. Um, so this is when like, the boutique agencies like ours come in handy, while the bigger agencies will work with bigger organizations um, and work directly with their, with their marketing departments. Uh, but, you know, this is the organization that are also used to working with the agencies. Um, so again, like you need to define, you need to define your, your target market, really. Like, are you, you know, are you, are you, are you targeting the other agencies that will hire you as a, as a subcontractor or are you targeting the, 
end user uh, and if that's the case then who are they like are they small 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 businesses are they medium-sized business are they large corporations you know there's also there are small businesses that are new to the industry there are also small businesses that have been doing this for 20 30 plus years and making enough money to you know afford proper services there are, there are startups or new businesses that are just trying things and you know they are going to make mistakes <laughs> So it all depends. I guess there's like three channels in a way because there's the ad agencies or marketing agencies that are dealing with big clients like Coca-Cola, for example, right? And they might they'll they'll probably bring on like a production company for their projects. Then there's like the small to medium sized marketing agencies that are dealing with clients that can afford I don't know maybe ten to twenty k a month um, for their services. And the video might be a part of that service as well. And then I guess there's video production companies that are just like doing videos for companies and might throw in a little bit of marketing or like just let them think about it. I think they're all separate in a way because again, like if you're a small to medium sized marketing agency, you won't be able to pitch your client on, hey, let's hire like a video production company to create a video for you because that video will probably cost anywhere from five plus right that might eat into like their whole budget for that mm -hmm. month right and that's just one video usually if you're doing a lot of content when you're a marketing agency i'm assuming you're giving them multiple deliverables over the month you can't give them like three three videos that'll be like 15k minimum right that'll eat through like that month and the month after right so i guess i guess carol in a way we're thinking about it like we're all kind of in the same bubble but it's kind of like we're different as well so yeah the line is blurring for video production companies but in a way it's like separate it's not part of the same sphere it's because they're all different clients the, the, yeah. the it, some people um i feel like a lot of uh companies and agencies feel like they're all selling to the same clients or at least the way that's the way they talk about it at least that's what yeah. i've seen over the last decade or so being in the industry is that everyone talks about clients as if they're all the same they all have the same needs but as we've gone through it, everyone has completely different needs. Uh, like a lot of the time, Dario and I work with uh, specific companies that have also marketing departments. So they're all handling that side of it. It's almost as if they're the small ad agency within the company and they just need uh, to simply outsource the, the the video content. So that's, for example, where a lot of the uh, clients that we work with specifically, whereas there are other companies that work specifically with small uh, sized uh, businesses that, you know, need a little bit of content every now and then. So they work directly with owners, you know, and it's very bare bones um, or, and, and kind of like a, with you as well, Sasha, where August media works with like small to medium sized companies, but they're a little bit bigger, but they want to have one vendor that handles everything for them. Cause that's a very specific need. And I get that convenience. I, if I had to go to five different vendors and manage five, imagine getting emails from five different people, for the same campaign you're probably doing when you can get it from just Sasha, right? You know, it might be a little bit easier. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, you guys are running your own small business as well. So, you know, every, every email or every unnecessary meeting is, you know, that's, that's, that's an opportunity lost somewhere else. Right? Yeah. Yeah. As you said, time is, time is key. You have to try to find ways to save it in whatever way you can. And, uh, if determining in your internal process that it's better to work with one specific vendor, that is something that you've developed and, and discovered within your business that is going to be key to saving you time and money, right? Time is money. And that is one of the key ways to do it. Um, I, I also want to quickly bring back, um, you mentioned um, over the last few years, you started to have very exponential growth and uh, you had to first take um, and pause briefly to kind of see what you can do to improve. What was the very first thing you guys did when you realized you were having that uh, that challenge, mm, I wasn't like, what did we do physically? Um, just called a meeting, like had a little brainstorming session, um, kind of try to get everyone's perspective on what was what was what was happening. Like, why is it that we're busier than ever before? But you know, not showing the the right the right profits. You know, so everyone got a chance to kind of talk about their challenges uh, and the things that they're missing in their day-to-day -day life. Uh, but at the same time, you know, as a leadership, like we also showed the challenges that the company was going through and, you know, how it all kind of like fits in together. Right. Um, so one of the first things that we realized uh, was, again, like when you work with artists, when you work with a perfectionist, 
uh, people who would do whatever it takes to get the best, absolute best product to the client or, you know, service their needs. I could think the first thing that we realize is that we're not billing back a lot of our clients for a lot of things that we're actually delivering to them, right? Um, so that was that was kind of easy. Uh, second thing I realized is that, you know, there are far too many revisions and back and forth. And it wasn't always because of the clients. It was because, again, like our processes were not done right. Uh, you know, like we're not getting the briefs um, properly or like the briefs were missing the information a lot of the time. Again, when you have a big team and multiple editors involved, for example, if there is a, some sort of a gap in the communication and the information is not being transferred properly, then you end up doing a lot of revisions that, you know, a lot of the time you can't even build back for because, you know, it's not of the client's fault. Um, and then when you when you onboard so many new people at the same time, you know, the people who are not necessarily familiar with the culture or um, for a lot of them, this was the first time like working in the agency or having a full time job as opposed to being a freelancer. You know, we also quickly realized that our onboarding wasn't wasn't the best because we were used to like onboarding maybe, you know, like one or two people every quarter or every six months. And then it would be just like shadowing with us for as long as it would take when everyone was working from the office and then we, you were right next to someone more senior. Right. So here we're like hiring at a faster rate, working remotely, servicing different type of clients <laughs> and then. You know, um, yeah, we're just we're just not we're just not ready for it. And I feel like, you know, some people understanding that something wasn't working, they started coming up with their own processes. So you have two or three people basically responsible for the same kind of task, but following three completely different processes. So the yeah, so the first thing was really to just kind of like you know talk about the challenges, but also document every single process that every single team member was a part of, and look for those gaps, look look for those opportunities, look for the bottlenecks. So explain like a bottleneck. Uh, give us give, give us an example of a bottleneck you guys had. Uh, so one of the bottlenecks uh, could be. Um, having only two video editors. So the first one was, you know, all our videographers were also the editors. So, so you know, once we got too busy and like, the work started piling up uh, and then it was really hard to hire for, like you can't hire for the geeks because then, you know, when you're really, really busy, then you have all those people kind of sitting there, editors sitting there waiting for, sorry, when we're really, really busy, uh, then it's great when you, when it gets a little bit slower than you have, you know, a lot of people just sitting there like, kind of like waiting for work. Um, so we started using uh, an outsourced team a little bit more. So went ahead and like I hired some editors in Ukraine uh, that were more so on an on-call basis, but we're still a continuation, continuation of our team where they're still it's still exclusive, but, you know, they didn't... They, 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 they didn't want to work like 40 hours a week, for example. They were okay with uh, short, shorter, shorter weeks, uh, but they were there to support us when we really, when we really needed them. Um, so that was kind of the main one. And then the second one was definitely the bottleneck was the number of revisions where, you know, like we would always expect to go through two or three revisions per video, for example. But when we got busy and we got all these new folks, uh, then the revisions went up from like two or three on average to like five or six, right? So this is something that you also can't plan for. Like, hey, like there are all these other projects that are piling up. There are all these other projects that you need to go and shoot and build for. But instead, like you're sitting there and just, just working on the revision after the revision after the revision. Were the revisions a result of just mistakes on the editor's part just because they were too overloaded or was it because the client was asking for more revisions uh so both so the clients were normally asking for more revisions because you know we didn't have the right tools to collect the initial uh ideas and um we didn't have the the, the right brief form um and then a lot of the time because the new people were not fully fully or properly rather trained um and then a lot of the times, because some of the clients had these expectations where, you know, they can get, go through as many revisions as necessary and not going to get billed for that. Right. So it was a little bit, a little bit of combination of all the different things. So I had to go back to the clients and educate them like, Hey, you know, like if you're asking for something, 
you know, if there is a change of scope or something completely different, we have to bill you for that. You know, if, if you didn't notice something on the previous revision, we have to bill you for that. Uh, but also, you know, if it wasn't your fault, then obviously we have to go and like train our people or change our processes. So all these different things, there wasn't just one. With the, the revisions, um, there's something Kirill and I have had trouble with in the past where like we've had clients that do come back with more and more revisions. And sometimes it is stuff that they didn't mention on previous drafts i'm just wondering how you deal with that because with us like it's always been like going forward we are going heavy on the education front where it's like look we can do this many revisions and even when we send them a contract and we're going through it it's something we've we've outlined very clearly on that because it is something that does eat up a lot of your time and you can get uh you can get stuck in um uh what was that what what did amy call it do you remember she had like a term for it it can become like a, like a tumor almost like it just keeps growing out of control. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes uh, they like, uh, as you mentioned, Dario, the, um, we would talk with the client uh, before the project, see what they want to, and, and figure out what the brief is. And then once the video is delivered, they might have say, for example, like a specific thing that they're just not, that they want to change. You know, maybe they didn't um, the song there, they're a little bit more um, not feeling for the video and they want to try uh, several different ones until they find one that they like, you know, for example, in that situation, sometimes, sometimes they, they, they want to make the changes after everything's already done, or they've heard from someone else in their company. Hey, we saw what, what that was, but maybe we should try this now. And then all of a sudden everything has shifted. So how have you handled like those particular situations? Um, it's definitely through communication, setting the expectations, find that a lot of artists struggle, especially at the beginning of their career to, you know, go back to the client and say, hey, like, this is going to be extra, right? So again, like being the perfectionist and trying to please every single client and win them over and make sure that they're going to come back, they go above and beyond to the extreme. Um, and as I said, like, because a lot of our guys, like they used to be freelancers as well, then they, they had those bad habits. That's what I was when I was telling you like about the billing where we would find out that, you know, like there's certain things that we did and we never even built the client back because, you know, people are just not used to doing that when they were running their own business, when they're freelancers, they would just, you know, do whatever it takes. Um, but yeah, basically communicating to the client, educating them, telling them ahead of time. Now, when we send the quote now, um, not only do we tell them that there's going to be an extra fee per revision after a certain number of revisions, but we also ask them how many stakeholders are involved in the project, how many different levels we're going to go through where, you know, you feel like you're done, you know, the marketing department approved it, but then they're like, oh, now we need to send it to the senior leadership team, or now we need to send it to someone else. And it'll be like, wait, what? (laughs) Like they haven't seen it yet. (laughs) And then as you said, like, you know, they're going to come back and say, "Mm hmm, I'm just not digging this music, you know, can we, can we change the music? And to them, it feels like a small thing, uh, but for you, like you need to re-sync everything, go through all the footage again. Um, yeah. So again, like they're all these little things that we learned over the last two years. Uh, and, you know, like you can identify the red flags and say, Hey, like, it sounds like with this type of client, we need to be upfront with them. And, or I can kind of guesstimate what it's going to cost and how many reasons we're going to go through. So I'm rather like incorporate that into the price. So no one likes extras, right? Nobody, like if you give someone a quote for let's say $10,000 and then with all the extras, it comes to 20 grand, which is double the budget. Then that's going to be, it's going to be bad. So we like to incorporate as much as possible and try to guesstimate and try to, you know, use our previous experiences to figure out, you know, what, what are we going to go through when it comes to the post-production specifically? It, it's smart um, that you're going through all, you're letting them, know, you're asking them how many levels mm-hmm. of leadership does this video or photo or whatever needs to yes. go through, right? Because then Very I'm cute. guessing you wait until, if they say like it needs to go all, all the way until this level, you wait until you've gotten feedback up until that level before you present them with the revised draft, right? Exactly. That's smart. That's what we should have been doing. That's very smart. Okay. I, I actually learned this uh, on a project uh, a few a few months ago that we did, where uh, I realized uh, we were we were working with like the marketing department, but we were also doing it for a client of theirs. And um, when we were giving the the revisions to them to make changes, we were doing it, and then they were like, "Great, now we have to send it off to them." And that's when I realized, okay. And I started doing this with future clients, where I was saying, uh, or with future projects, saying. Um, 
uh, here is the draft. Let us know uh, uh, once you've gone through it yourself and the client. Make sure all of you guys have looked at it, collectively decide what the changes are, and then we'll do it. And because of that, less revisions, much much easier process. You know, it's always little things that you have to make uh, adjustments on in the processes that will make your life so much easier down the road. And for example, the question you just said is a very simple one, but sometimes people forget. It's like, how many stakeholders are there in this project? Such a simple question, but not everyone thinks of it right away. And that's that's a great way to kind of filter out and figure out what the whole project is going to be. Because as you mentioned, nobody likes to have surprise expenses. You have to try to guesstimate to the best of your abilities, how many revisions they're going to be, because it, it is an uncomfortable uh, conversation to tell the client, hey, it's going to cost this much if you want this many more revisions, because you know that it's going to not necessarily leave a bad taste, but, you know, it, 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 it hinders the experience a little bit, you know, and and that's ultimately what you want to give them is a good experience. So, so again, like if you look at your historical uh, numbers and you see that you constantly go over on the revisions and instead of doing like one or two, you're constantly doing three or four, well then include the four revisions to your pricing. Tell the client that only two are covered. And then if they get three to four, you basically, hey, it's on us. You know what I mean? So it's, I always like to surprise them with good news as opposed to bad news, you know? Same thing with, I don't, I don't know how you guys do it, but I still see a lot of vendors who will charge an extra 3% if you pay their bill by credit card, right? Well, why don't you just include that 3% into your price and give someone 3% cash back if they pay by check or email transfer? Oh, uh, you know what I mean? And like, I, like our clients absolutely love it because they're so used to like smaller vendors, you know, like adding 3% on top of the bill. And we're like, no, we're not like that. We're actually going to remove 3% if you pay by check. Right. So same thing with the revisions. If you know that you're constantly going over and that's a common issue with our industry and it doesn't matter how well you train the client, it's just like, when was the last time you produced a video with two revisions? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I, so when never. there's a time crunch, that's when, that's <laughs> right. when you do less revisions. It's like, oh, you need it tomorrow. I mean, we could only do really one revision before that. <laughs> And then another thing on the revisions that I learned in the last year, I can't remember where I read it, but it was, it was game changing. So when you send something to the client, it's, don't ask them, um, what was the question that we normally ask? So you send something, you know, let me know if you, if you need any changes. That's the question that 90% yeah, uh, We stopped doing that long time. Oh, yeah, and, then yeah, yeah. and then the client will, <laughs> will, will decide that this is their job now, you know, to figure out what else can be improved. Right. So and I, I know like a lot of artists are, are still doing that. Like, don't 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 ask them, don't ask them for changes unless, you know, they know something needs to change. I'm even going as far as uh, debating on removing the question of let me know if you have any questions, you know, because I'm feel, I feel like that's like uh, the cousin of that other question. 100%, 100%. <laughs> 100%. And especially if you yourself know that this is how many times have you done something where you were like so satisfied with the post and like how the video looks like, and then you send it to the client and then, and then they basically ask you to change things. And then the video looks worse than, than it did before. So many times. Right. So, so yeah, times. just say like, Hey, like I'm, I'm, if you're, if you're generally happy with it and you know that you did the best job possible, then say, Hey, like, I'm so excited to share it with you. Um, yes. That's <laughs> honestly, that is a great way to do it. We don't hype think, ourselves up. No, I don't think we give much. ourselves enough credit sometimes. And we're kind of like living yeah. up to the client to talk to us about the creative where they hired us as creatives to begin with. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I, I think I think if they, you know, actually, that's a good way to kind of uh, reshape their perspective, where if they're seeing us excited so much about the project and product that we produce for them, they're probably going to be happy with it as yeah. well, at least unless it's like something super minor that needs to be changed. Whereas if you go, it's like, oh, here's our here's the video. They're going to think, oh, maybe we need to make some changes because it's all about how you presentation is so key. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you have to sell it twice. You have to sell it, you know, you have to yeah. sell your services first and then you have to sell the, the, the final delivery. product. And the better you do that, the happier the client is going to be and, you know, the less work for you at the end. Yeah, I that's think we all forget that though, we're we present, That's hilarious though. We present it and we go, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
but that's a good way to uh, frame it. You know, you're never done selling uh, in, in the whole process. You know, you might, you sell in the beginning to get the client, but you also have to sell the product when it's made, you know, uh, yeah. not like not being uh, uh, disingenuous, but you know, you have to also show how excited you are to share that with them, you know, because you know how it, it really is satisfying to finally complete something for a client, give it to them and then see their reaction, you know, and see um, like uh, how much they like it. And yeah. yeah. And trust me, like they don't want to go to revisions either. Like they want yeah. to work done as soon as possible. Like they don't want to get built extra. They don't want to spend more time. So yeah, it's just the way a lot of it is like hundred percent of it is really communication because yeah, you know that your work is great. <laughs> otherwise, they yeah. wouldn't have hired. You know, otherwise, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. But I feel like part of it sometimes is uh, the also because you're communicating through email. I feel like sometimes yeah. the energy gets lost because it's through email. And uh, one thing I, I want to try to start doing with uh, more and more with clients is maybe having more phone calls also with them uh, in later stages of the process, because we try to do email because we're trying to also be respectful of their time where they can't always hop on a call. Mm -hmm. But sometimes doing a call can really answer a lot of questions because sometimes they might ask a change, uh, ask you to do a change that. Uh, they think will work, but they haven't really asked you if, if that would work. And it's a little bit harder to kind of de not necessarily debate it, but explain um, how it would fit in the edit over email. So Carol, it's better I, to have I maybe had an like idea. a post call. I just had an idea. You know what we should do? If we are going to implement that where we do call them, we should get them on a Zoom call and then do uh, present the video screen share and then show them. And then if they have like some suggestions like that, actually show them what it would look like. Exactly. I forgot, I forgot exactly said, what I was talking about. I, I forgot who said this, uh, that they like to invite their clients over for an editing session to see instead yeah. of inviting them in person, since we, we don't really do that. You can do it virtually, at least. That's not a bad idea, actually. That yeah. doesn't that does still involve them past the the uh, uh, the, the production process, uh, the production stage as well. So they are still involved and they do still feel like they're a part of the, the experience as well. Yeah, love it. And it doesn't. And yeah. it doesn't feel like a revision process at that point. You know, it's like a presentation, any initial thoughts they might, they could tell you like, oh, this was great. You know, like, I, I, I think the video was, uh, was great here. I, I think there was just maybe like this one little section that we might need to just adjust, you know, like uh, just some spelling or some text. Maybe we could add some text for that section to, to really beef up the information. It's like, great. I'll send you the video after you let us know exactly. And then we'll make that little change. And that's, that should like, if you're, if you it's did like, your it's job like showing well, a teaser. It's like yeah. teaser before the yeah. trailer, you know, it's just a little peek and then they get to see the full thing. That's, that's exactly cool. we should do that. So, so we actually yeah. do that with our with some of our clients where, you know, we'll just get them on Slack and then we'll just share our screen in Adobe After Effects or Premiere and then literally just work on the video together with them. So if it's something oh, okay. a little bit more kind of like dry and, you know, uh, very like corporate and if the context is very important like instead of kind of like going back and forth uh yeah. we'll just have them right there and do all the work with them online how do you um, do it on slack slack has that function so slack is basically works the same as, as zoom but the one thing that we like the most about slack is that a like you can you can hear the sound and then you can also draw on the screen so if you need to bring your client's attention to something, you can just like circle things or draw errors and then vice versa, like the client can draw on your screen. So if you're editing something and then the client can circle something on your screen. It's I absolutely didn't know easy. Slack. I didn't yeah, know Slack, Slack is, had that. Fun. We, we got to look at these. That's, <laughs> that's really interesting. No, no, even like that's the only thing that we use. And then I do the same. So I'm not an editor, but when I work with my editors a lot of time, again, like because we're not in the office, you know, we'll just jump on Slack and then we'll spend like half an hour as opposed to, you know, you're doing something and you're rendering it or, <clears throat> and then uploading it somewhere, especially like with the client, it saves so much time. Do you use Frame.io? We use Frame.io, yes. Okay, yeah, that's good. So that's I, another I, thing that, you know, uh, with some clients, it's a little bit easier. Others will still, you know, go through the video on Frame.io and send you a Word document with 75 things <laughs> that you need so to change. I actually found another challenge uh, when getting Frame.io because originally that thing where they, they give you a document and, you know, you have to look at the timestamp yeah. on it and then try to make sure, figure out where it is in the video. That was, that was the first problem that it solved, but it introduced another issue where they send the video to everybody 
And then there's 10 people giving their notes and then they're even debating in mm -hmm. the comments. The thing, yeah. when, the so ever since then, I, I, I started communicating to clients saying, uh, please have one person from your organization uh, comment exactly what you guys want for the uh, for the changes, just so that we know that you're all on the same page. Or if it's like you and a client, have the client, one person, and you, the agency, one person comment on there. And then if we have any questions based on those comments, we can touch base with you and, and determine it from there. Because I remember there was one comment chain on this one particular note. It was like 10 like comments. 10 people. Like, 10 people. <laughs> Like, at least, like, at no. least it's still, it's still it's still all in one place like it would have been worse if it was going over the emails and like back and that's, forth that's and true that's, so it's, it's yeah it's collective chaos <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but we basically tell them that hey like if you have strict deadlines uh and we don't have much time then we're not going to accept a word document we're not going to accept anything in the thread of the email like you go on frame io and you make all your comments right there and if you can't then <laughs> we can't promise that we'll be able to deliver either right? yeah what kind of system uh, so you use slack for a majority of that you also use frame do you use anything else so, so our go-to tools, obviously Frame.io, Slack, and also Monday.com is our overall like project management tool okay. uh, that helps us stay organized. I uh, also use it for all kind of like reportings, like metrics, KPIs. Uh, that's like literally uh, this is this is our go-to. Like we spend most of the time on Monday.com. Interesting. Yeah. Well, it's also connected now to our website. So, you know, like if, if the clients are submitting like any type of requests, uh, it goes directly into monday.com and we can action it in so many different ways. So we can respond to their emails directly from there. We can assign it as tasks, um, like add everything that we need. It is absolutely fantastic. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, then, and then we, use, we still use, uh, we use Harvest to kind of like track our own time as a, I don't know if you guys... Are, uh, no, that's good because we were we were uh, looking for something that could help with that because a lot of people have been saying like you know they they measure yeah. how much each each thing costs based how much time they spend on it but mm -hmm. we never really asked how they measure it and some of them mm -hmm. didn't know so that's good to know that there's a tool out there like Harvest uh, yeah. that you can use to measure measure that that's good so it's great and even if you're not necessarily like, you know using that to build the client back at least as a minimum it gives you a lot of data. Uh, you know, so you can price your work accordingly going forward, right? So everybody on the team uses it and we say, hey, like, this is not to kind of like monitor your, you know, productivity or this is nothing personal. Like, this is just to help us understand how much time and effort is going into every project and understand whether we're pricing everything correctly or not, right? Whether there's an opportunity to be more productive or we need to, to charge the client a little bit more. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, well, Sasha, we're a little bit over the one hour mark at this point. And, uh, you before, know, we before be... we end it off, Carol, there, there's yeah. two things I want to add. There's small things. Um, okay. Number one is uh, what kind, what books are you currently reading or have you read that you recommend our listeners yeah. to read? And then the other one was uh, what does August Media? How did you guys come up with the name August Media? <laughs> Start uh, I'll first. start. I'll start with the with the with the name first. Uh, as you know, like we're part of different business in the creative industries, and we try to keep everything kind of like under its own under its own name, so that we don't confuse our 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 clients. Um, and then most of the names are kind of closer to the end of the alphabet. Uh, so when we decided that we want to do the creative agency, we decided that the name would have to start with an A. Um, um august is definitely like our favorite month of the year like it's summer but it's not as silly hot as it is in july uh augusta is also uh svetlana's grandma's name svetlana is my partner uh, in august media the creative vision behind it <laughs> i'm the numbers guy she's the she's the creative one so augusta is her grandma's name uh so i thought it was you know was fitting to to Pay some respect uh, to our previous generations that brought up brought us up. Um, yeah, so nice. Yeah. And and, uh, then, any, and, and the books? Any yeah. books? Uh, that's a funny one. Don't make fun of me. But uh, I finally read The Great Reset by Mr. Schwab. 
uh, to educate myself a little bit uh, and literally learned nothing from it. So <laughs> I was telling you, like I come from the process improvement background. So the whole like, you know, progress automation, robotics um, is not is not anything new to me. So I feel like there are a lot of people who are giving way too much credit to, uh, you know, to this this whole movement and the book itself. Uh, yeah, um, is it worth it? I feel like everyone who is stressing a little bit about the future and everything that's happening in the world right now should probably read it uh, to put themselves at ease. Um, but otherwise, it's like most of it is just common knowledge. And if you're following the technology, if you're following the economics, if you're following them, there's going to be like absolutely nothing new to it. Okay. Nothing to well, be scared of, <laughs> but <I'll> get... <laughs> you know we all we all we all need. And as the last two years showed, and you know everyone needs like the no, most important skill to have these days is the adaptability, right? Yeah. You can't depend on you know the previous success on the previous skill set. You know, like once you I don't really back in the days, once you master something, you can kind of like sit back and enjoy <laughs> enjoy your ride, like nowadays it doesn't matter how good you are at anything you know you still have to stay on your toes and you know watch out it's like it's like year one every three years <laughs> uh, uh, yeah absolutely absolutely yeah 100%. okay well, Sasha, well, thanks thanks again for uh, uh joining us again after two years you know maybe in another two years we'll check in again <laughs> see how much august media has grown Sounds good. Well, yeah, no, as always, it's nice to stay in touch with you guys and following your success as well. So and we appreciate yeah, that. I feel like I feel like all of us um, have learned so much in the last two years that yeah, fingers crossed, next two years are gonna be <laughs> are gonna be a little bit easier, but we're still gonna continue learning a lot so. from each I'm other. Sure we will. <laughs> from each other, most importantly. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you.